Hey everyone, my name is Alex Pond with the UNM Division of Community Behavioral Health. Welcome to today's webinar presentation for the Safety Planning and Seeking Safety Training for Behavioral Health Providers webinar series. A couple of announcements. Please make sure your sound is muted during the presentation. If you have any questions, please submit them in the chat or feel free to unmute if Avi or Jen opens the floor. For those requesting CE or certificates of completion, we'll share an evaluation link in the chat towards the end of the presentation. And in order to receive the certificate, you must attend the full presentation. If you have any questions regarding this, feel free to reach out to me directly. And I will now hand it over to Jen. Thank you. Hey, good morning. Um, I am just wanting to touch base before we jump into um, the material for week two. So thinking about this past week um, with the risk assessment and safety planning, um, I wanted to open it up for us to bring our, our thoughts together and, and what stood out to us the most, um, some gems that we had, things that were clarifying for us. Um, you can either write it in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, we're just gonna kind of be bringing ourselves back into the material. If there's anything that um, that stood out to you that you would like to share, please, please bring it forward. Last week with uh, risk assessment and safety planning, we were talking about the CSSRS as a screening tool and doing risk assessments, thinking about home safety. There was a lot of information. Um, but if there's anything that anyone um, would like to share, please do. I think one thing that that um, that I recall that was sort of um, I was like, oh, that's new information for me. Um, was thinking about how 90% of people who had attempted suicide but who um, didn't complete suicide, like minutes after that incident, like um, reported, you know, like that remorse. So just thinking about so that in that sort of impulsivity, that aspect to it, in contrast to sort of like, you know, this meticulously planned thing. That was something that stood out to me. It is early for me to put you all on the spot at 9 a.m. Is there maybe one or two things that anyone um, felt like was like a, a good takeaway from last week? I think you know it was very important to know that um, there there is data. It's still very complex to predict it, but then there are things that we can do to at least try to prevent as much as possible. So it, it's it's kind of like bittersweet. So I really like that that reminder that um, there's some things that we can do, um, but at the same time there's some aspects that we cannot predict. Mm hmm Thank you, Dr. Fernandez. That's helpful. Um, just bringing us back into that, remembering that and reminding ourselves of that, that there are some things that we can work together on as a team and like we can be informed and that there's going to be some aspects to it that we might not necessarily have the answers for, but that we are like AB was saying, like as a, a, a profession and as a field, like we're much more informed about prevention than predicting. So that's why you know, there's just not so much this emphasis on predicting it, but on prevention. Um, and then I was shocked, um, Hope was saying, I was shocked to know that New Mexico had the highest suicide rates, one of the highest suicide rates in the nation. Yeah, and then thinking about like the language of triggering and kind of moving away from that language. Um, some I really think good point. Some, something that stood out to me, and I'm probably not gonna say this correctly, <laughs> But um, there was conversation about how if somebody uses maybe a less lethal means, but 
they still have intent. And I think it was using Tylenol or something like that, that maybe that was even worse than using, I'm not gonna say it right, but something about like maybe, or that was just as bad and should be taken just as seriously. Um, yeah, like the intent, right? Like if someone's yeah. like, I'm gonna kill myself and they take a handful of Tylenol, um, that that like it, that we're really looking at that intent. Is that yeah. was that the piece that you were speaking about? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's I'm, important. I'm glad that you brought that up, Elizabeth, um, because I think um, what I tried to emphasize, and you know, this is again um, my experience as a child psychiatrist, um, is that a lot of times we think um, as sort of what would a rational adult do. So if someone believes that um, a particular dose or a particular substance is lethal, that's what's really critical. Um, and I know that in times past, and I know that it still happens in you know, emergency rooms and other places, is that they look at and say, well, that couldn't possibly kill them, so we don't have to worry about that person. But if that person really believes strongly that taking just two Tylenol was going to kill them, then um, they're um, at very high risk of hurting themselves, right? And the flip side of it is, if they're unaware that a certain substance taken in a certain dose, and I gave the example of sleeping pills or pain pills, again, for children or youth, if they think, well, that's pretty harmless, um, still, they're... Um, risk of dying is great, right? And that was the other point that I um, was um, wanting to make to all of you is that we get into this very narrow description of what's suicidal versus what's not. And if somebody doesn't intend to die, then we say, oh, they're, they're really low risk. But if somebody puts themselves in jeopardy, in risky behavior, so I think I mentioned this last week, but Whenever I go out into the community and I'm talking about suicide prevention, I talk about preventing risky behavior as opposed to suicide per se, because a lot of people put themselves at risk with no suicidal intent whatsoever. So whenever we do a risk assessment, even if it's labeled as suicide risk assessment, we really wanna look at what puts that person's safety in jeopardy. And um, we have to worry about people dying <laughs> as opposed to did they meet our, you know, sort of clinical scientific descriptions of whether or not they're suicidal or not. So thanks for bringing that up. I'm, I'm, I'm really appreciated. Thank you. And I appreciate you saying that again and hearing that again. Um, that was just really eye opening for me. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. So um, I'm going to uh, launch us into uh, safety planning. Thanks a lot, Jen, for leading that. And um, I really appreciate the people who are speaking out, but also know that, um, you know, a lot of people um, have thoughts that they feel um, uh, they would like to share like one-on-one. -on -one. And so feel free to email um, or reach out to me and Jen in any other way, and we'll be happy to talk about things beforehand. Um, and the other thing is, is that um, um, Molly wrote, I wonder what it would be like in 2020 and 2021. But one of the things we have to talk about too is that, and I might've mentioned this briefly, is that suicide is only reported when the medical examiner says that somebody's suicidal and um, it's massively underreported. So I give this example, it's a true life example of, um, a youth who um, had um, a, an abrupt severing in a relationship with his girlfriend. His girlfriend was having sex with um, this boy's best friend and he, he found out about it. He got into a car after fighting with both of them and finding this all out. Um, and he had been drinking really heavily and he ended his life driving the wrong way on I-25 and hitting a, a bridge abutment. And everybody, this was published, but it was seen as somebody who was a drunk driver. Well, like we had talked about last week, 
uh, a significant stimulus for people being impulsively uh, desperate and suicidal is some kind of rupture in important interpersonal relationships. So he didn't leave a suicide note. He didn't make a statement that he wanted to die. So the medical examiner couldn't rule it a suicide, but by all accounts, it really was. So this is a way of saying that it depends on how states report suicide, right? Um, but um, another factor that we have to look at is in 20 and 2021, um, we were number two or number three per capita. That's still pretty horrific, but we were number one in youth suicide clusters for the country. So that's also really important to look at as well. Okay, now to safety planning. So um, what we're going to look at today is the overall structure of safety planning and uh, that you can hopefully at the end of this, look at the steps that are involved in, like we talked about last week, co-creating collaboratively in a welcoming kind of partnership a prioritized list of coping strategies and sources of support people can use during or preceding crises. And as was mentioned, and I'm, I'm um, again, really um, heartened by the fact that you understand that even though it's very limited as far as our ability to predict suicide, we have increasingly good tools to prevent suicide and to prevent people who are suicidal from killing themselves. So what I wanted to emphasize here is there is this stepwise process. It's intentionally building to a certain point. Um, it's really important to follow the sequence um, of safety planning and the prioritized list. That is their priority. Again, we are there to honor their understandings, their beliefs, their backgrounds, their preferences and their values. We don't insert ours on them. Um, and so we help brainstorm with them and look at options with them, but they drive this process. And then specify, um, especially why we talk about limiting access to lethal means towards the end of safety planning rather than the beginning, or instead of doing just lethal means access counseling, and not doing the rest of safety planning, why that's problematic. Again, Jen and I have nothing to disclose. And this is a brief review. All of our sessions, I always like to begin with a brief review because not everyone could attend every session that we have. So I wanted to emphasize that suicides are preventable, um, primarily by re restricting access to lethal means, early identification, early treatment, training of all of us, um, looking at responsible media reporting to minimize suicide cluster and contagion, and the importance of follow-up care and community support, because like mentioned, unfortunately, the greatest risk of people killing themselves is on discharge from residential treatment, inpatient psychiatric hospitalization, or the emergency department after being told that they do not need or mandate um, being committed to an inpatient unit. So again, suicides are preventable mainly because they're transient and there are suicide specific evidence-based practices, which we alluded to last time and we're gonna keep on talking about and they're in the references in the back. By the way, for those of you joining us for the first time, I'm responsible for all the content and you'll be getting PDFs of all of the PowerPoints, like you know, and uh, they're meant to be references for you. So I'm not going to read through everything. And there's an extensive set of references at the back, both on suicide prevention and safety planning. 90% or more of the people who attempt suicide do not go on to die by suicide. And like Jen said, that really registered with her. Another thing that I like to emphasize is that a significant majority, almost all Americans, believe suicide can be prevented. They're not hopeless about it. And if they knew that somebody was at risk of suicide, they would want to help in some kind of way. 
as opposed to shunning them or looking the other way or not wanting to be involved. Now, today, what I wanted to start with is why is the way that we typically use risk assessment problematic? So typically what we do is we have this very reductionistic, simplistic, either or kind of approach. We assess for risk and then uh, we either refer to inpatient hospitalization or refer to outside therapy. And that's all. We don't do crisis intervention of which safety planning is a huge part of. We don't do lethal means counseling. Uh, and we don't trace through all their ways of coping on their own, their ability to self-manage, what has worked for them in the past, what doesn't, all their supports, all the different aspects of safety planning. All we do is say, well, we don't see you as great risk. Um, you're going home. Here's hotline numbers and here's numbers to call to make an appointment. We don't even make the appointment for them. Or we say the opposite, we really need you to be in the hospital. And essentially, if you don't want to agree to being in the hospital, we feel strongly that you need to be and we will get the court involved. Um, so typically when suicidal patients are evaluated in the ED and hospitalization is not clinically indicated, they're provided with a referral for outpatient mental health. Now, why is this assess and refer approach problematic? Number one, it can be disconcerting to patients and their families. People can experience formal risk assessment and management as disempowering, as life context and personal decision-making is mediated by clinical appraisal. This is a fancy way of saying that we don't take any of that into account. We don't look at how they make decisions, how they manage and take care of themselves. We don't look at um, what their situation is, what their beliefs are, what their supports are, nothing. All we do is look in a very limited way at what they say about suicidality and what preparations and plans and attempts they've made. Adding to the anxiety of discharging patients who are experiencing some measure of suicidal feelings is the fact that many suicidal individuals do not attend recommended outpatient treatment. Between 11 and 50% of attempters refuse outpatient treatment or drop out of outpatient therapy very quickly. Furthermore, up to 60% of suicide attempters attend only one week of treatment post-discharge. Of those suicide attempters who attend treatment, 38% terminate within three months. So in other words, very few follow up. And the longer the wait, the less likely. So another thing I'd like you to think about is that since so few, so few people who attempt or plan or talk about serious suicidal ideation, severe suicidal ideation, follow up, we really need to take advantage of when we see them. That's why crisis intervention in the moment, including safety planning, is so critical. It may be our only opportunity to help that person. And hopefully safety planning will generate reasons for living, a good relationship, with all of us so that we're seen as not just risk assessors who determine disposition planning, but we're really invested in helping that person in that crisis in the moment. So safety planning is the co-creation, the collaborative co-creation of coping strategies and sources of support. The basic components of the safety plan include number one, recognize warning signs of an impending suicidal crisis. And like we talked about last week, and uh, I was really excited by all of your creativity and thinking about what warning signs are for you. Warning signs are not risk factors. Warning signs are for folks saying, I'm not managing this situation well. I'm slipping out of control. I'm getting into a dark place a place where I'm feeling more hopeless and worthless. I see myself um, withdrawing from friends. I see myself not taking care of myself. I'm not bathing or showering or getting up in the morning or eating. I'm more irritable, more angry, whatever it might be. And that, like I said, is the stimulus for them to initiate the safety plan, which we're going through with them. 
And I like to compare it to the medical thing of, this is when we teach asthmatics to use inhalers. This is when we teach diabetics, oh, you better check your blood sugar. These are symptoms of either high or low blood sugar, or you need to return um, to your PCP or your endocrinologist to better manage your insulin dosage. So this is the precipitant for when to initiate the safety plan. And it's better to initiate it when you're in doubt as opposed to have certainty that you're really going downhill, right? So we wanna encourage people not to have extreme catastrophic warning signs, but incremental warning signs that say that things are getting more and more difficult for them. That's the first step. The second step is looking at internal coping strategies. And what we first do is do an inventory of what has worked for them and what has not worked for them. And uh, I suggested that you think about a solution focused kind of approach, looking at all the times when they might have felt more hopeless, helpless, worthless, impulsive, but didn't as opposed to being overly curious about all the times when they were most impulsive, most suicidal, most desperate. Because when you have a difficult time internally or with other people, and yet you pulled on your strengths instead of feeling out of control and helpless, and that the only way to deal with it is to not deal with life, and you had difficulty finding reasons for living, then you find, oh, I did have coping strategies that I used. What was it? And it could be that you reached out to friends to help you. It could be that you distracted yourself instead of ruminating or mulling over, driving yourself into a pit of despair about what didn't work well. You said, well, these other things work well, or these other things take my mind off of it. So you distracted yourself, you soothed yourself, you sought out support. So we wanna find out what do people do naturally? And then we wanna build on that as opposed to see them as lacking all these skills and supplying them with what we think is best. They are the experts, we learn from them. And then after the internal coping strategies, then you look at social context as distraction. And distraction is an excellent thing. It's pulling people out of that space of feeling hopeless and helpless. Um, one example I like to give a lot is some people will say, well, I don't have any friends and I don't have any acquaintances. And then it turns out that uh, they like to take a walk in the park or they like to walk their dog in the park and that they see certain people on a regular basis. So it can be as simple as just planning to be out in the park when they see somebody who's friendly or has a friendly dog that's friendly with their dog, something for them to see, be planful about and look forward to and say, I just need to get outside of the house. I usually feel better when I take a hike, even alone. So, um, but it's really important to reach out to other people. And we minimize a lot of times um, people who are really important to us, but we don't think of them as close friends so we don't realize how useful and important and supportive and connecting they are. Then looking at people to, um, as the next step, um, who might help resolve the crisis. So in the first case, we're looking at people to do fun things or neutral things, right? And in this space, we say like, well, you know, um, Molly, um, who's joining us um, online, Molly Faulkner, She's a great person to talk to. She's really good at problem solving. You know, let me contact Molly. Um, she's a really good friend. Um, so this is not in Molly's role as um, a social worker and a nurse. This is Molly, my friend. After I do all these things, I know um, when I'm slipping, I've looked at what I can do on my own. I've looked at how to connect to friends either for soothing and distraction and connection or for guidance, counsel and help. Then after all of that, I look at all of us, contacting mental health professionals, agencies, hotlines, 
warm handoffs, texting lines, drop-in centers, et cetera, all the professional stuff. And again, a lot of times with the assess and refer model that we're talking about why it's so deficient, one of the things that we do is we don't talk about self-management, we don't talk about natural supports in their environment, um, good people that um, are motivated to help. And remember that statistic, 94% of people, if they knew a friend or an acquaintance was suicidal, would want to help in some fashion. All we do is give them hotline numbers and professional numbers and say that that's adequate. And then after we do all that, then we talk about reducing the potential use of lethal means. So the first five components are employed when suicidal thoughts and other warning signs emerge. Reducing access to means is discussed after the rest of the safety plan has completed, often with the aid of a family member or a friend for an agreed upon period of time. So why is safety planning so essential? Why should safety planning be added and part and parcel of our risk assessment and referral process and disposition planning? It's essential to developing an effective safety plan. And that's because collaboration, this is a collaborative intervention. We're on their team. A clinician generated risk is unlikely to be helpful to a patient in the absence of knowing what strategies are most compelling for that person. What's in their natural repertoire? What are they motivated to do? What do they wish to do? Similar typical activators to suicide feelings are not useful if they do not have a personal relevance. So that's why it's important to look at warning signs, particularly vouched for and understood by that individual, as opposed to risk factors for the population in general, because it might not resonate with them, speak to them, have any relevance to them. We wanna learn from them uh, what's important. Now, somebody mentioned this again, about being careful about using words. We talked about not using the word suicide gesture, right? We talked about not uh, looking at attention-seeking behavior. We talked about the problems of talking about committing suicide because we commit a crime or we get committed to inpatient psychiatric hospitalization against our will. So in the literature, constantly uh, the word is triggers and like I explained, I think it's really problematic to use that word because the main way that people die from a suicide attempt is using a trigger on a gun. So if we constantly say triggers, and when we get into talking about seeking safety, which was written um, in um, about 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, actually, that the word trigger permeates the manual. And we don't wanna use that word because we're talking about guns, 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 triggers all the time. So I'll say activators or precipitating events or what happened to you in that moment that had you feel in a certain kind of way, but avoid the word triggers. On the other hand, the patient is not left alone to struggle with identifying their stress and best means for coping. Instead, clinicians can offer suggestions and inquire in a supportive manner to help the patient complete the intervention. So we're there. Um, a lot of you have probably heard this term. It's from Lev Vygotsky, a Russian psychologist, about scaffolding versus the foundation. So a scaffolding for a building is that very temporary structure to help support the building that is built on its own foundation. If we're the foundation, what that means is everything that we've built together gets destroyed once we lift that foundation, that person is helpless. But if we scaffold, help them build their own structure, their own way of looking at being in touch with their reasons for living, their value, their purpose, their meaning in life, then we've done the kind of preventative work that reduces risk and enhances safety. So safety planning is also a flexible approach. That's really important. We tailor it to the individual, right? 
So safety planning interventions decreases depression and hopelessness, shows improvement, reduction in suicidal ideation and behavior, reductions in hospitalization, improvements in treatment attendance. Again, when somebody approaches us in crisis to be evaluated whether or not they need to be in the hospital, what they're saying is that their coping mechanisms are not sufficient to meet that particular moment. And so when we engage with them and say, look at all your strengths, look at all your supports, look at all the things that you can do on your own, look at all the people that want to help, that are there to help, look at all the professional kinds of things that are available to you, people like me, people like my colleagues, people like people that I'll introduce you to. There's all these helpers out there and you're the biggest help of all to yourself. That's a, an incredibly powerful message. Suicide um, is remarkably reduced with safety planning in all these ways that I've talked about. Safety planning interventions have been shown to be adaptable to the clinic area in its modality, digital, paper-based, face-to-face, online, clinician or self-administered, standalone or combined with other interventions. Most suicidal specific therapies, especially the ones that are more evidence-based like the collaborative assessment and management of suicidality model, CBTSP, interpersonal therapy, and dialectical behavioral therapy incorporate safety planning as a major part of what they do. And after we finish this unit, we're going to talk about seeking safety, a evidence-based practice for co-occurring trauma and substance abuse, both of which have high risk for suicidal and impulsive and self-destructive kinds of behavior. And what we'll talk about is 80 to 90% of seeking safety is safety planning. So a study, I'm thinking about this. Go ahead, Jen. Oh, Avi, I was thinking about like the sequence that you've been talking about, um, and and sort of like the, the the neurobiological underpinnings of it, which I find to be really interesting but helpful too. Like thinking about this co this aspect of co-regulation and and like within solution focused work, you know, therapy, like she talks about, you know, amygdala whispering sort of. So there's something that's that's calming for someone thinking, talking about their dog, thinking, seeing their dog, their emotional support animal, say that's one, the only thing that's worth living for. So there's this resourcing, there's this like, you know, it's, it's an intervention in itself. Um, and it's, and it, 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 and it sort of is this scaffolding of like building up this foundation um, that's decreasing the disconnection and increasing connection with you and and building that before you're sort of coming to this place of looking at something that's a much more difficult so they're kind of coming at it from a more resourced and skilled place because even like practicing a skill together can like build that that efficacy of like doing grounding so I feel like that there's that the sequence I think is so important, but then it's like, it's so interesting, like, well, why is it that? And what, is, what exactly is going on through that initial process and how important it is to build that rapport and make that connection? Yeah, that's great, Jen. Um, and um, I think it's one of those things where, uh, like you're implying sort of like our neurobiological understandings sort of parallel what we find in clinical practice, you know, and that's why, um, when we're looking at it, what we're really doing is um, an, another framework for looking at this is what Kahneman talks about type one and type two thinking. So type one is that fight or flight impulsive, um, right? As opposed to the metacognition stepping back, looking at ourselves in a calm way. Well, how do we get to that calm place? And part of it is like we're talking about all those ways in which we soothe ourselves, we quell that agitation, right? Um, and uh, so- Totally. Uh, 
they're all aligned. But like, how can you collaborate if you don't have that? That's sort of the question I've been asking myself is like, really, if, cl- if collaboration is really important, someone's metacognition really needs to be on board for us to do that justice, like for us to really be collaborative. So how can I support this person to be able to that's collaborate right. with me, you know? And that's, um, and like we'll go into when we talk about seeking safety, and I know that Jen is steeped in that as well, is that's why grounding and centering, which Jen alluded to, is so critical. And it's a great technique for anybody who's agitated. Um, and that goes back to, you know, like we talked about, when we looked at what people report, um, besides the things that we are well aware of, the helplessness, hopelessness, worthlessness, self-hate, the agitation, and they don't mean physical agitation. What they mean is they feel desperate to act, desperate to change the situation. It's again, that fight or flight impulse that I've got to handle this now. And the only way that I can think of it is like running and escape or hurting myself um, impulsively without being able to step back. So the very first thing is to say, let's look at that before it becomes to a crisis. What are the warning signs that tell you that you're about to enter into that state, right? And then here's what you can employ right away. Grounding and centering, soothing, distraction, exercise. How do you do the minimal self-care to get you into that place, like Jen and I are talking about, to be interactive, right? And take in the other person and what they have to offer and connecting. And more importantly, connecting to your reasons for living, your value, your meaning, your purpose, and take a look back to have that ability to look at yourself, metacognition. So um, to finish this piece, a study of safety planning intervention, thanks again, Jen, with a telephone follow-up was associated with 45% fewer suicidal behaviors. That's an astonishingly good result, right? That almost half reduction of suicidal behavior over six months, just with one, one episode of safety planning with one, okay? And it lasted for over six months. And that one safety planning intervention more than doubled the odds of attending at least one outpatient mental health visit. Again, it established that someone like all of us is interested enough to spend an extra 15, 20 minutes to do safety planning, give people all these tools, so they're much more motivated to follow up because they know that they can get immediate benefits from working with someone like us. So this is that summary. It's a stepwise collaborative approach with an agreement and a commitment to use the skills, the safety plan and support to get through times of high emotion and distress. Like um, Jen was talking about when the amygdala is firing left and right, right? Before trying to hurt yourself. So recognizing those warning signs, on my own coping, self-management, self-care, with a friend coping, reaching out to people, and it doesn't have to be a friend, it could be an acquaintance. It could be somebody that you barely know, right? In the neighborhood, but somebody that you enjoy conversing with in a very casual way pulls you out of yourself. And it doesn't have to be um, a person that you meet face-to-face, it could be virtual. I know a lot of people who connect in positive ways. Social media isn't always negative. Um, So I know that some people play video games, um, even internationally with other people online, or you can watch movies together um, on some of the streaming platforms, have movie parties with people in very different locations. So it's all sorts of ways of connecting to people. And then the tell someone coping is again, when you say, I just don't want to be with Jen and have fun with Jen, I'd like her opinion on what happened to me. And if she has any advice or suggestions or ways that she can support um, the part of me that feels more invested in life. Remember, that's another point that I made last week is when you go through the risk assessment and you do it with safety planning. So is there some part of you that feels like life is worth living? Is there some part of you that wants to sort of at least experiment 
was self-soothing? And what would that look like? And what part of you doesn't feel that way? And then asking for help is really asking for professional help, okay? And then um, we talk about reducing potential for use of lethal means, making the environment safe. And I'm now gonna um, guide you through why that's so important to do it in this stage-wise process. Jen helped us take a look at why we have to start with those soothing, distraction, comforting, exercise ways of being to help our body be less on alert, to help our mind being able to focus, to help um, look at neutral and positive things as opposed to being overwhelmed by catastrophic, traumatic, and negative things. That's why the sequence is so important. And then this is often missed, but we should do this in any clinical intervention. We always wanna discuss, now that we've been through all this, how likely are we to do this? And what obstacles do you see now? And typically, and I compared it to some of you last time, I can't remember which groups I brought this in, but to me, it's like writing a prescription for medication, not saying any reason um, or rationale why we're prescribing that pill, not talking about the benefits, the side effects, or how you take it, and the prescription says take as directed, and then leaving somebody on their own, as opposed to going through all that. Um, what do you think about this medication? Here's how long it might take. Here's some predictable ways it might help. Here's things that it might not help you with. Here's some potential adverse or side effects. Here's side effects that go away with time, et cetera. So knowing all that, how likely are you to take, like as an example, you know, we know that when we have a bacterial infection, typically the doctors will say, take the antibiotic at least seven days, if not 10 days. And maybe you need to take it two or three times a day. And then a lot of people, they'll feel better on day three or day four, the fever is gone, the symptoms are abating and they'll say, oh, I don't need to take it. And then they've actually made things worse, right? So it's really important to talk about what might get in the way of using the safety plan. It could be very practical things like they don't have transportation, right? They don't have access. Um, they have um, an environment which is again, chaotic, neglectful, traumatizing, disruptive. And so nobody will support them doing the safety plan. Um, so it's really important to brainstorm with them in the moment, what works, what doesn't work, figure out alternatives. And every time you see them, revise the safety plan accordingly. And again, um, it's, to me, it's the same thing as if we're medicating somebody, if we get the culture back, from the blood that says we've chosen the wrong antibiotic, we switch antibiotics based on that feedback. We should do the exact same thing with therapy. If someone says, well, I really tried this, I did my best, it just didn't speak to me, it didn't work, I had another crisis, then instead of saying, try harder, this is the only thing that we know how to do, it's like, what else might work? What else speaks to you? And again, safety planning, is a process, not a device, with lots and lots of options. So is seeking safety as a therapy. So revising the plan according to their feedback. Here's the template, bit by bit. So again, what are some of those early initial thoughts, feelings, behaviors that lead into suicidal thinking? Warning signs. What are some distraction activities that I can do by myself? Self-management, basic self-care. Who can I call to help distract me or provide distraction? And again, distraction in this sense is a wonderful thing. And I don't use the word distraction. I just say, pull you out of that place. That's a bad place for you, an unhappy place for you. What gets you into a place where you don't think about all these things so much or even you're not thinking about those things because in the moment you're feeling joy, you're feeling comfort, you're feeling safety, you're feeling pleasure, right? And then who can I call for help? Who can I tell I'm suicidal? Who can take me to the hospital? That can all be 
how you ask for help. It could be guidance. It could be practical things like, can you help me get to the appointment? Because I have no one else. And I know that you care. And then, only then, after going through all these things in the way that Jen and I have outlined, then all the professional uh, referrals, right? How they can reach us and what times we're available, who's on call for us if we're not available. And MCAL, New Mexico Crisis Access Line. And pretty soon we'll have the nationwide emergency number, 988. Any on call person, urgent care, hotlines. And then we talk about lethal means access. Sharps, guns removed, or ammunition removed from guns, or gun access limited, supervised, medications are locked up, expired medications are thrown away, alcohol is locked up, etc. And then we end with reasons for living. What is the most important thing I need to remember about why I should live? And again, hopefully after this sequence, where we've gone through all the things they can do on their own, all the ways in which other people can be of help, all the professional resources that are at their community, and then the lethal means counseling, which again, we'll talk about next. Hopefully they're more optimistic, they're more focused on their values, meaning and purpose in life. Why again, in retrospect, like Jen mentioned that that was news to her, but so many people who are acutely suicidal, if they survived a potentially lethal attempt, in retrospect said within seconds or minutes, why did I do this? And I never wanna do it again. I never wanna do it again. So what is the most important thing I need to remember about why I should live? Here's one other framework called the safe T. So we identify the risk factors, protective factors, the suicide inquiry of which the Columbia screen is a part of, determine that risk level intervention and document. And one thing that I would encourage you to do is always document as if you're unavailable. So what would happen? So if it's Jen's um, person that she's seen and I'm her backup, that she documents so that I know exactly what she's done and where their work is headed. So one of the things that's most um, demoralizing to people is having to, if, let's say that they were seeing Jen on a weekly basis or every other week for six months, and then she's unavailable and I'm filling in and I'm saying, start from scratch because I know nothing. It's as if Jen's work didn't take place at all. So it's really important to document enough so that one of us can pick up the torch, right? And carry it forward as opposed to starting from scratch for all sorts of reasons. So now this is really- important. Sometimes I'll, I'll make sure that it like reflects the language that they feel good, like about say, if someone was to, to, to ask you about this and I'll read it, does that sound right? Like, is that, is that how you would want someone who you haven't met before on your team or someone on your team like, you know, just to make sure that we have the right language. So I'm, I'm kind of like helping them to anticipate that, you know, someone might bring this up and, and use this as a tool. So um, Jen, you um, again set the stage brilliantly, <laughs> not knowing that you were doing that. So that's the whole thing of that collaborative assessment and management of suicidality. It's this parallel process. And again, it follows that principle of they're the experts, they teach us. And everybody who knows me as far as a supervisor or a teacher um, is that we quote them as much as possible. We use their language and their understandings. They teach us who they are. And that goes whether we see them in groups or families or individuals. So um, Jen is right on because words mean different things to different people, right? And um, it's just as important as like, you know, when you're seeing somebody in therapy, you want to remember the names of the people who are important to them and, um, as opposed to and what their hobbies are, what their interests are, everything that makes them a, a person as opposed to, you know, that we identify them as, quote, a patient, passive, receptive, uh, an, a non-entity, and 
uh, much worse that we define them by their illness. A person is a person, not a disorder. So instead of saying, I'm seeing a schizophrenic, I'm seeing a person who suffers with psychosis. And that person is very different from another person who might suffer from a similar problem. So um, again, keep in mind what Jen said is use their language, use their understandings, and most important, use their strengths, competencies, talents, beliefs. That's what's really important. Get to know what's important to them and use it. So why do we um, look at reducing access to lethal needs? Remember that idea that suicidal thoughts and motivation can intensify within a very narrow window of time, with 70% of those making suicide attempts making the final decision to act within one hour of the attempt. Remember that in one study, 13, 24 year olds, that more than a quarter of them made the decision to act within five minutes, within five minutes. So most often it's a very impulsive, transient decision. That's really important too. Those amygdala firings, right, that Jen was talking about fade, and then they look back in a more calm and reasoned way at themselves and say, I don't want to do this anymore. There's other ways to deal with this. And that's again what safety planning can support. More than a third of you suicides were within 24 hours of an interpersonal crisis. Okay. So that's the other thing is that most often the stimulus for suicide, especially for youth and young adults, because relationships with peers is so important and friends is so important that it's not internally generated. They're responding to something that changed in their interpersonal environment or in their physical environment or both. Context, really important. And again, our planning, our interventions should be contextual as well as psychological. Most people are ambivalent about ending their own life. And again, one of the classic studies uh, that I referred to last time is that one about people who jump off the Golden Gate Bridge where 95% who, who do that die, but 5% survive. And of that 5%, 90% plus do not go on to die by suicide. And they were followed in this study for decades, not just for months, not just for a few years. They never went on to die by suicide. And most of those also did not even make an attempt after that near lethal episode that they survived. Survivors potentially suicide attempts speak of regretting their attempt within seconds or minutes. And I cite the, the bridge study because you know, unlike using a gun, which is instantaneous, or using pills, which takes hours often before it starts to really react with them. When you jump off a bridge, you have that moment when you left the bridge, right, in your midair, and that can be within milliseconds or seconds where you start to have those second thoughts. That's how impulsive it will be. And again, why do we focus on lethal means? Because if you use guns, as many as 95% who use a gun in an attempt die. If you suffocate, and that includes hanging, and like I mentioned last week, unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, um, especially in American Indian boys and men, the method of choice is not firearms, it's hanging. That can be more than two thirds lethal. A fall from height, 31% lethal. This is really important. You know how in years past, and a lot of us still do, focus so much on overdose and poisoning. Deliberate overdose with suicidality only 2% of people who took an overdose died from that overdose. 
as opposed to 95% of people who used a gun. Cutting 1% or less lethal. And when we look at, for instance, gun safety, the rate of suicides versus homicides, like I mentioned last time, you know, we're horrified as a society, understandably so, and alarmed by mass shootings. But who do guns kill? People who use them in suicide attempts. And some estimates are that five times more people die from suicide using a gun than use a gun for homicide. So if guns are out of the picture and people are well supervised, so it's very hard for them to hang themselves and not be found for hours, if not days. Look what we do. We cut down lethality by up to 95%. And what often happens to people is if they don't have those lethal means handy, they might be intensely suicidal, but within minutes or an hour of being on that search for finding something to end their life, they again question it. Question the need to end their life and look at other possibilities, other possibilities for themselves. So that's why reducing access to lethal means is so critical. Now, why do we do it when we do it? Why is it one of the last steps in safety planning? In developing the safety plans, mean restriction is addressed after patients have identified ways of coping with suicidal feelings. Because if they see that there are other options to acting on their suicidal urges, then committing suicide, they're more likely to engage in a discussion about, they're more optimistic. And what we can say is, you know, it might sound strange, but most people feel acutely suicidal, like they really wanna die just a few minutes after something terrible happens to them. And then within a couple of minutes more or a couple of hours more, they don't wanna do it again. But you know, if a loaded gun is handy right at your fingertips, when you feel that desperate, you could die from that. And if that gun's not available, you could feel in that moment that you really wanted to die but there's no way to kill yourself. And within minutes after that, you don't feel that urge anymore. So why have the gun handy? Why have the gun handy? So depending on the lethality of the method, the manner in which the method is removed or restricted will vary. This is how to do lethal means counseling. Next week, Jen and I are going to talk about all those steps beforehand. And then the following week, Two weeks from today, we'll be talking only, only about counseling to limit access to lethal means. So we're gonna go through this in great detail. No worries, okay? <laughs> um, here's the basic idea of it. Um, express your concern, ask if there's a plan, ask about access, explain they can reduce the risk by reducing access to lethal means, particularly firearms, discuss specific steps they can take and their loved ones can take to remove or reduce access. So that's what we're gonna be talking about in two weeks. Again, we end with discussing the likelihood of personally using the safety plan. And the best safety plan is comprised like Jen was underscoring for all of us of interventions based on the likelihood of success and the willingness of that person what's in their words, what's in their experience, what's in their way of being to carry out a particular intervention. So um, we need to end for today. We always wanna end on life worth living and uh, hope, the installation of hope, which is our goal, hope and safety. Um, here's specific references about safety planning. And I'm gonna quickly move to, here's the QR code and uh, Alex is going to take over and tell all of you how to get CE credit for today. Alex? Thank you, Avi. Thanks so much. Um, so uh, you can scan the QR code with your phone or go to the link below. I also shared the CE link in the chat and I'll do it again now. 
Um, I will also be emailing everybody a PDF of today's PowerPoint presentation, and that'll also include the CE link. So let me know if you have any questions, and uh, we'll see you next time. And thanks so much, Avi and Jen, for everything today. See you in a week, everybody, and feel free to email us in the meantime.